Welcome back. I hope you didn't go far, but while you were going, I hope that you were thinking a lot about what we talked about earlier about those quilting styles, because now we'll go into the next phase, is how should I quilt it? Or what should I be thinking about when it's quilted? Because there's a book that was published several years ago called It Isn't a Quilt Until It's Quilted. And that means you've got to hook it together, those three layers together in some way. And that can be a number of ways, and that choice will certainly be you, yours to do. So I want to talk now about those decisions that you might make. Because if you remember earlier, I said that while you're doing the patchwork, while you're doing the applique, I really believe that it's helpful if in your mind you're thinking about how will I quilt it. Because there are a lot of decisions that you may need to make. For instance, a decision in which direction might I press the seams. Because if you plan to quilt in the ditch and you press all of your seams open, you have no ditch to quilt in. So you have to think about these things. Do you want to quilt it simply? Does it really require a lot of decorative quilting? Or does the fabric itself uh, create the design and the fabric is the focal point there? They can be simple. Very simple crib quilt that I do very often uh, for charity work is just simply a piece of fabric sandwiched together quilted about every four and a half inches. It's the purpose here that I'm dealing with. It's a quilt that I w don't want to spend a lot of time on, but yet I want to make a quality product. So I make these, I put the binding on, then I sit at night doing, uh, watching television while I'm doing the hand stitching on the binding. So again, the purpose is one that it's not going to require a lot of decorative stitching because this is something that's going to be lovingly abused by a child somewhere. And so I want to make a sturdy quilt that they can use simply for that. There's some patterns then that really don't call for decorativeness. Here's one This very simple bar type quilt has the strips in between. Now I could have put a quilting design in here, but I really didn't think it needed it. It just needs quilting in the ditch here to hold it all together. The other interesting thing about this quilt is this was a series of samples that one of the fabric companies gave me. They were all cut exactly this way. So I'm really get becoming interested in being the frugal quilter. So these were on the table and I kept looking at them and I said, there's enough there that I can do just a bar quilt and then put it together with these strips. So again, it didn't need it. It's quilted sufficiently that I didn't need decorative quilting in here. Very easy quilt to put together. Even out in the borders, I quilted an inch out here. Good sturdy. One thing I might say about quilting is that your batting companies will give an indication on their packaging about how far apart you're quilting and the batting will still stay stable. That's a good thing to follow and to look at because at least you'll know the parameters that you're working in. But yet, does it really need to be quilted that far apart? Does it need to be quilted uh, closer? Those are the decisions that you make after those first rules I gave you earlier about the accuracy of your patchwork. This is the part that's strictly up to you. Another very interesting pattern called peekaboo, which is a dimensional quilt. I don't know where I would quilt this one, you know, because you have all of this dimensional work in here. So I simply quilt it in the ditch, just enough to stabilize it and hold it together. And again, because this is the focal point, I didn't think that the border needed any kind of decorative quilting in it. So those were the decisions I made there. You can quilt by hand, quilt by machine, or the other technique that was very popular was simply tying the quilt. And that's rather than quilt it, you know, with stitches, they, you would come periodically and use embroidery floss or some other kind of a larger thread, thicker thread, to tie the three layers together. A very easy technique was used for utility quilts a quilt that was uh, uh, needed to be made very quickly. 
I have one at home that I was looking at the other day that obviously has another quilt inside. It's an older quilt, probably early 1900s, and instead of regular batting, it has another quilt inside and it's tied. So it was an easy way. It's all part of that being the frugal quilter. Now I want to go to the other table and to show you some examples of quilting as the old timers did and kind of give you some background into the type of quilting that they did. These quilts on this table, the first two were made by, first one was by my grandmother and then the second one by ants. They were prolific quilters and that's really where I first got my first introduction to quilt making because in the winter time, there was a quilt that hung from the ceiling uh, on a large frame and hung from the ceiling with, with rope. And I would play under the quilt and I would watch them. So that was my introduction to quilt making other than to sleep under a quilt at night. The traditional quilting technique that they used was what they called the fan pattern or shells. It comes a number of names, but it's an old traditional pattern and it was used primarily for the utility quilts. And utility quilts were those that were used every day. You know, they were not decorative quilts. Quilt makers always had a group in the closet that were the fancy quilts and they would get them out when company came to show the quality and the workmanship of, of their uh, particular quilt making skill. But the utility quilting in, in shells uh, was traditionally done. It was a quick way to quilt. The first one was done that way. The second one that was done by my aunts, same way. You can't see it on the back, but certainly here on the front you can see the shells. Later on in the programs I'll be talking and giving more detail and demonstrate actually how the old timers did it and those tools and equipment that we have today to make it much easier because it is becoming more popular. It's an easy method, it's an easy technique, and a great machine quilting technique to do this particular pattern. Another quilt is very interesting. In 1978, the U.S. Postal Service issued a postage stamp commemorating quilt making as a folk art. And I was privileged to be part of that activity because I lived in West Virginia at the time and worked with the uh, Department of Culture and History to uh, curate a quilt show in Charleston. And the 30th anniversary, which was in, in uh, 2008, we did, uh, we reproduced the quilt, uh, used uh, uh, fabrics that uh, were reproduction fabrics dating to mid-1850s. Uh, the interesting thing about this is it has minimal quilting. And this again is a decision that you will want to make. Does it need any kind of decorative quilting on it or does it just need quilting to fix the three layers together? In the center, it's quilted a quarter of an inch out, as you can see in these blocks, which gives a little bit of definition. The border, however, did have a diagonal quilting in it, which adds some decorative to it white background, so it certainly needs something to give it some dimensional effect here. So this is a, a, an exact reproduction of that quilt. Then another one, which I enjoyed, and I do like this one, and it had some very special consideration when I quilted it or while I was making it. This was designed from a Navajo Indian rug using the traditional Navajo techniques. And when I was thinking about the quilting, I thought about the dimensional effect that the woven rug would have. And so it was quilted horizontally every half inch. And when it's hanging at a distance, it does look like that woven rug and has a great dimensional effect to it. The colors are traditional Navajo uh, hand-dyed fabric looks. Now I want to go back to the other table because there's some other factors and other considerations and examples that I want to give you there. Remember I said earlier that uh, quilting in the ditch and when you're piecing it, the directions that you uh, iron your seams will determine how you'll be quilted. 
Here's a good example that really backfired on me. I made this quilt. Uh, the request was for pink. Uh, the circumstances that I was going to give it away uh, were that I didn't want to spend a great deal of time with it and, and not do any decorative quilting on it. Uh, you can see here, since I've had it for two years, the intended person is probably not going to get it. Well, they didn't know they were going to get it in the first place, so I'm probably okay. But all the time I was piecing these blocks, I was thinking, well, I'll just quilt in the ditch because that will be easier. However, when I was making it, I pressed all the seams open, so I had no ditch to quilt in. So now I've got to decide how I am going to quilt it uh, sufficiently to give it the dimension that I want. And I'll talk about that specifically in a separate episode. Two other examples. <coughs> Again, a very simple patchwork geometric quilt. Doesn't need much. I didn't want to put much in it. So quilted a quarter of an inch out from, from the edge. And that gives it dimension uh, because I could have put a decorative design here, I could put a lot of stuff over here, but it's sufficient the way it is. And then the, another example here, a design that I did which I call Morning Star because of the ray of light that comes out, didn't need any quilting. It just needed quilting to reinforce the design or the shape of the pieces that was here. So again, don't get really obsessed about the fact that you might need to make a lot of very highly fancy quilting on it because it might not really need that. Think about the purpose of the quilt. Here's one that I really have had a dilemma about and I'm not sure yet what I'm going to do. Um, another very simple design. I looked at this, I saw large areas here that could accommodate a quilting design. But yet, this is not the focal point. The focal point is this star right here. So I felt if I put feathers or whatever here, the, the eye would be drawn somewhere it shouldn't be. So I have an idea this one will just be quilted maybe a quarter of an inch out or in the ditch in something very simple because <coughs> this is what I want to show, the star. Don't let anybody ever tell you that uh, there's nothing original left in the world because this one I believe truly is and I was doodling one night and I have never seen this particular star uh, done in any pattern or any book and it's simply made out of squares and half square triangles so very simply same thing is true with morning star I was doodling one day but the distinctive thing about this is these diamonds are not perfect. They're a little bit sideways and that's what gives the effect and then the use of the fabric here gives the ray effect in it. So there's still some originality left in the world and uh, you can be created. Sometimes it happens by accident. Sometimes it becomes deliberate. Another example is this Amish looking quilt. <coughs> didn't need a lot of uh, decorative quilting in it uh, because it's the fabric that gives the, that gives the impression or gives the design is the fabric. I have this quilt. It's a sampler quilt, has a lot of different designs in it, has a lot of open space here that you can see. Confusing when you're thinking about how it would be quilted. Um, what is the focal point? the blocks, what I find in the solid space, whatever it is. Stay tuned. We're going to be talking about that as the series progresses and I hope that we have a solution at the end or at least an idea about the way that we might go. I'm Hollis Turnbow. Hope to see you in the next episode as we step deeper and deeper into those three words, quilt as desired.